everyone for coming. We have a, a very special guest today, thanks to the young Tunisian-American professionals, which uh, we have a tradition of doing events together since uh, the revolution in Tunisia, many times uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and uh, many of you know how important is uh, the presence of the young Tunisian community in America because in, especially in the transition, uh, they were really very important, and especially with the American friends, which didn't know, maybe, the reality of a country which uh, I am Italian, Tunisia, Italy, so are not first uh, class powers, uh, world powers, and so on. But they can become... Uh, in their history, very, very important countries. Also, if we, we share many things, uh, couscous, uh, we don't have oil, <laughs> we, we have beautiful girls and so, but, <laughs> but today Tunisia is a country which is probably the topic in the area because everyone needs, and what we say every time that we have an event with Mohamed and the other friends of the Tunisian community, Everyone needs Tunisia to grow, to be successful. And everyone knows that the Tunisians have two problems after two years after the revolution. An economic problem and a political sec securitarian problem. And this is why we have invited three friends here and one will be linked from Tunis, from the African Development Bank, is the chief economist in charge of Tunisia, is a young economist, so is uh, also a very interesting person, but if, uh, if I may say, the most interesting person is uh, the former governor of the Bank of Tunisia, because everyone, like about Italy, Monti, Berlusconi, so, is asking what's happening, what will happen in Tunisia, because uh, it's really something that is a concern for everyone. So, please. Thank you uh, for this uh, very generous uh, presentation, but... Uh, I didn't know what, what I was going to say, so uh, because I wasn't sure what, what, what the audience is, is interested in exactly. So uh, maybe I will throw in a few uh, ideas and uh, maybe comments, and then maybe the discussion will be more, more useful. Uh, but first, uh, thanks for the organizers, everybody from SAIS to uh, TYPE to uh, PROMED, uh, and uh, for this opportunity. Maybe the, the, the one, maybe I can uh, really uh, emphasize one point, maybe on, on which I can try to comment a little bit more. Uh, and the point is, is really about looking forward. I'm not, and then I'll come back. I think as we look forward over the next few months, maybe in the next six months, or uh, I think we, we are going to see something happen, which is the politics and economics are, are going to collide. Uh, politics and economics are going to come head to head. And uh, it might, if we don't, we are not careful enough, it might produce some unwanted consequences. So let me try to explain what, what I mean and why is that. Uh, so going back two years ago, over the last two years, the political track has really gone on a separate track from the, from the economic track. Uh, they essentially, politicians ignored economics and ignored what needs to happen on the economic front. Sure, they were aware that, you know, you need, you need the economy, you need the economics to go on, but really they didn't pay attention. They were just overtaken by the political agenda. So the political agenda has moved in such a way, I, you know the, the events, I'm not going to uh, come back to, uh, you know, to the different steps and uh, different aspects of what happened. Uh, but there was a political process which has been taking place, which we call the transition process. And this process uh, now is stuck and, uh, uh, on its tracks. It's... it's uh, it's not moving. Uh, the political process is, is stuck. 
uh, because the objectives that were set for this transition process were that we should be having a uh, transition towards a new constitutional constitution, to new elections uh, taking place, to new democratic institutions uh, taking shape, and, uh, and so on. And on all of this, uh, you know, for the last year or so, uh, we, are, we have been stuck. It's not moving. Uh, the constitution process, we don't know where it is. The, we don't know when there are going to be new elections. Uh, the uh, institutions that we were expecting to see emerge are not emerging. And even the government, uh, which, was which was coming out of the elections of October 23rd, uh, now is in shambles. Uh, we have a government which has resigned. We have a possibly a new government. And the coalition around which the government was constructed has been exploding. And uh, the political landscape is just uh, does not look, look good. Uh, this political process has been ignoring the economic imperatives of the transition. Uh, it means that it has been ignoring the impact of this transition on investment. It has been uh, ignoring uh, the impact on the uh, financial sector. It has been ignoring the impact on the uh, macro balances, uh, ignoring even the impact on, on, on employment, which is really a critical dimension of, of what is. And it seems that the political players are just playing the game of uh, you know, holding on to power or reaching power, whatever it is side you are taking, uh, no matter what, uh, no matter what cost it might entail to the economy and to the population. So, so the political, so this political process, and I'm, we can come back and, and kind of dissect it a little bit more and say why we are at the stage where we are now in terms of why uh, we are seeing uh, no progress in the, uh, in the political reforms. We are, why we are seeing an increase in the use of violence in politics. Why we are uh, seeing this polarization of the political, uh, the political dynamics and the political, uh, the political game. Uh, all of those things we, we can come back to because this is really what's driving uh, what, what we see. So at the same time that we, we are seeing this political process kind of, uh, you know, going in this direction and uh, losing its way, uh, what, what has been happening on the economic side? On the, on the economic side, uh, what happened are a number of things. First, the cost of the transition over the last two years has been much more important, significant than one we ex that I expected at least and, and many people expected in terms of growth, in terms of jobs, in terms of, uh, you know, all of the economic indicators that we, as I, I estimate that the output loss in 2012 compared to uh, an alternative scenario where we could have continued to grow as before is like 8% of GDP in 2012. So that's a huge number, like 8% of GDP loss in one year. Uh, and uh, we have 200,000 jobs which are lost, which could have been created or, or have been actually lost. Uh, in addition, uh, a lot of indicators are really turning into the wrong direction. i just cite a few. Uh, inflation is, is up, almost doubling. We started at 3.5% inflation rate per year or so. We are at 6% now rate. Uh, the current account deficit, which is the balance payment of deficit, has reached 8% or more than 8% in 2012, uh, from less than 3% or so in 2010. Uh, the budget deficit, which was like 1.5% in 2000. 10 is up to, my estimate, is more than 8% in 2012. Uh, the debt level is, is up significantly, domestic debt, foreign debt. 
uh, the banking sector has more problems than it, it used to have uh, things. So all of the economic indicators, despite a, a, a weak recovery in 2012, are not looking are not looking good. Um, the prospects as we go forward, if the political situation continues as it is, is going to be much worse. These indicators are going to worsen as we go forward. So uh, coming back to my message that if, we, if things continue on the trend that they have been going, both on the economic track and the political track, I think there is an inconsistency which is going to you know, uh, take root. And uh, this is going to collide because if the economic situation continues to worsen, inflation stays high or becomes even higher, if the deficits uh, are higher, uh, there is something that's going to give at the economic level, something. I don't know what it is, but we know possible scenarios are, you know, one can imagine. And this is going to be interacting with the economic, with the political process. If the political process is not clarified and is not moving into a clear direction, into a predictable, you know, direction, and the economic situation becomes, it's going to feed into the political, it's going to make the political process even more difficult, and vice versa. And as the political process is becoming more difficult, more uncertain, this is feeding into the, the economic process because the expectations are, are not improving, investment is going to remain weak or even become weaker, and expectations are going to build for higher inflation, for weaker growth, for less security, and so on. And then you get into very, very bad dynamics. So, um, so the big concern is really not now. The big concern is, is down the road, is down the road, when we look down the road and, and, and we, we worry about what might happen. So that is why it is so important that what is done now really tries to take into consideration all of the dimensions of the, you know, the economic, social, and the political dimensions. And so it's my call, really, and what I have been saying in, in Tunisia, I'm saying it here as well, is that politicians need to take into consideration what the economy is going through and what are the risks. Uh, the economy has been receiving kind of a benign neglect. It seems that, okay, the economy will be fine. We'll, we, when we wake up and we're ready, we'll deal with it. It's, it the economy eventually doesn't wait. And it, it comes to, to hit you back. And uh, so really I hope that the politicians will wake up and try to figure out what to do in terms of, uh, you know, not... Uh, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, uh, moving or uh, at, at least avoiding that the uh, economic situation gets really into, uh, into a tailspin. And, uh, and this implies that, you know, that you have to work out the political process backwards. If you want to avoid the risks on the economic level, you have to figure out what you have to, got to do at the political level to do that. And this is very clear. I mean, it's not, it doesn't require much to understand, uh, you know, what needs to be done. It needs really to, to go back to more consensus-building politics and not division and not disruptive politics and not polarizing politics. That needs to be driving force of what we do. And uh, so trying to find what unites and what makes people you know, move together in, in, in a better, uh, better way rather than trying to pull apart and, and the society and disrupting the, the social and the political, uh, the political uh, framework uh, that, uh, that we have to live th through. So uh, that, that is really the main message that I, I wanted to share with you. I don't want to go too much into the technical economic details. I didn't go into the um, details of the current political, uh, you know, environment and, and discussions. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is that the current government crisis is really symptomatic of what, what is lying ahead, is symptomatic. Uh, it means that the political framework that we have and that we have been working with 
is not going to be able to withstand the pressures that we that we are going to face, both at the political level and at the economic level, and especially if they start interacting together in, in, in ways that I try to, to kind of develop a little bit. Uh, and um, so um, I think uh, the situation is critical, is, is difficult. It's not, uh, I'm not uh, saying that it's uh, a lost cause, and because some people saying that you know, uh, you know, Tunisian revolution has gone really uh, in off track completely. I don't think. I think it's still uh, we can still manage, uh, but uh, things need to happen. Things need to happen that correct the the, the, the path that we are taking in in the different dimension that uh, that I have uh, that I have mentioned. And uh, I think there is a hope that, uh, you know, people and the political elite and uh, the political players, as well as all of the other players, the economic players, who realize that uh, we cannot uh, keep going in this direction that we have been going through and, uh, and maybe correct our, uh, our trajectory in a significant way. Maybe I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, many, many interesting questions are raised. Uh, if uh, our friend and colleague Rodi is ready, we should have the connection with Tunis. Shall we? With Emanuele. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear us? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yes, well, uh, hello everyone and greetings from the evenings of Tunis and uh, I'd like to start off by really thanking John Hopkins University for having invited uh, us, the African Development Bank, uh, and myself in particular to be present to, to be here with you guys. Um, I was actually initially very, um, a little bit puzzled by the fact of coming after Mustafa Nebli it's always very difficult to come and say something, uh, say a few words after uh, um, uh, Mustafa Nebli was actually humbled by the invitation and be uh, part of this panel. But I think Mustafa actually made uh, my presentation a little bit easier indeed. Um, I think he rightly pointed out on uh, something that we feel a lot on the ground, which is really the importance of getting, getting it right on the economics and getting back the economic agenda on the on the political debate, uh, I think the image that that uh, Mustafa actually put forward was really the image on which I wanted to start off the presentation of a country which is actually facing a, uh, is a country at the crossroads uh, in several ways. I know that uh, other people speak more about the political dimension, but the way we look at it from here is that we see uh, pretty much a triple what I call a triple challenge. There is, of course, the political challenge of, of going through a political transition, the election, the constitutions, and I know there are going to be speakers speak, uh, speaking more eloquently on uh, those fronts, but really the political challenge of establishing a new democratic governance process and en engaging with wider society. This often leads and has led in the last few um, months to really uncertainty and a bit of a slower decision-making process. We feel it a lot on the ground. We are the biggest uh, development partner. We work a lot with the government. And one of the key issues uh, that we have, we have established is that the, the decisions are getting a little bit um, much more difficult to take. Uh, there is a wider arena, and there is a challenge of readaptation of the whole public administration in terms of you know, working in this new democratic space. But there is also the very important challenge that, that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nebli actually point out, which is the real economic challenge, particularly the need to address unemployment, the region inequalities, which requires a number of package of reforms, a number of package of uh, activities, structural economic transformation of the economy, we'll go more in details later, major reforms, but also very important, restoring trust and encouraging private sector investments, both domestic and international. Uh, all of this against um, a scenario where there's high expectations for urgent short-term solution, a sort of devolution, revolution dividend that people are expecting. And all this happening in a fiscally constrained environment, which pales very, you know, a lot of challenge in making controversial reform. Uh, all of this happens, a triple challenge that I see happens very uh, unfortunately for, for Tunisia, 
In a context of a backdrop of a very difficult external environment characterized by the Euro crisis, by sub-regional uncertainty, namely the, the Sahel in particular, uh, and coupled with high food and oil uh, prices. Um, but what, what is Tunisia? I mean, I understand actually, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of appetite of discovering this country. We see it very close, but I've tried to sort of extract ourselves from actually being in Tunisia and looking at how at least we used to see Tunisia a few years ago. We used to see Tunisia as a country with relatively solid growth, with a very well diversified economy, which benefits from a number of, uh, a number of reforms. Um, good geographic position, close to important export markets, very open economy, 40% uh, of GDP comes from the exports, relatively good country where to do business. I mean, Tunisia has been in the top, in the top ranks of top 50 countries according to do, doing business report. And, uh, and also uh, a very resilient country, and this is something that I like to really emphasize, uh, especially against the backdrop of uh, a lot of the the, um, the gloomy scenarios that people sometimes paint, there is, there is, there is a fantastic resilience. And is a lot of it has been driven by, uh, by the entrepreneurs, which have a lot of energy. And they've, they've, they are the ones, the, the Tunisian entrepreneurs, which have been able to keep this country up together. And, and the results that have been announced just, uh, just, yeah, just this morning by the National Statistics Office of, uh, of GDP growth in 2012 of 3.5 are in partly explained by this, this natural resilience of this country. But however, under the surface, what we see, we have seen increasingly in this country is, is a lot of problems. I mean, regional inequalities, structural employment, uh, you know, Mr. Ms. Nebley touched upon it, a lot of market rigidities, uh, banking sector in a lot of difficulties. I'd like to hear more from, uh, from, uh, from Mustafa, who actually had the chance to actually look at this from a much uh, closer perspective when he was a governor but also governance issues that, that are, take time to resolve. And now, more, more increasingly, an informal sector which is booming and which constitutes important, uh, important elements of the Tunisian economy. All of them leading to actually a need to rethink uh, Tunisia towards a more inclusive growth. Now, if you look at Tunisia, basically, in the last uh, um, 10, 15 years, there's, there's a country that's achieved a lot in terms of poverty. Poverty has reduced dramatically, but yet there are a lot of regional disparities. 70% of the uh, non-agricultural unemployment is in the coastal areas, and a lot of the investments are also in the coastal areas. You can see in those little pictures the, the red zones, the zones where the highest areas of unemployment and, uh, and um, uh, analphabetism is to be found, and you can see a big concentration in the in the areas of interior and in the south. This is one of the daunting challenge of, 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 of uh, Tunisia today. Now, there's also another interesting challenge is actually the high, you know, the the the, the, the education. Uh, there's there's been uh, in the past uh, 20 years a lot of investments in education, a lot of the uh, massive uh, investments in uh, in, uh, in universities scattered all around the country. But yet, a lot of mixed results. Uh, this affects, uh, with you know, on a, for a PISA score, it's actually this this international benchmark on uh, on education shows that important disparities from uh, uh, and the Tunisia is lagging behind on, on several grounds, and particularly in some of the regions actually are suffering the most. On the opposite, um, the Global Competitive Reports uh, uh, ranks Tunisia at, at number eight. In a, in a world in terms of scientists and engineers. So you really have a lot of mixed results in this, this, this labor force. Now, I'd like to focus today just very briefly on the, on the FDI. And that's where a lot of uh, some of the interesting uh, stories about Tunisia actually come. And going back to the issue of resilience, there's not been any massive outflow in 2011. And actually, in 2012, there's been a, quite a lot of, uh, of, of investment. You can see the chart in which actually investments in 2012 have gone up quite a bit. Now, a lot of this has been explained by two uh, privatizations that actually happen at the end of the year. There is an issue with those FDIs which generate very few jobs, and that's why it's important to also follow the other line that looks at the, the number of jobs created by FDIs is lower. But there are still other opportunities in terms of energy, ICT, medical services, and Tunisia has a lot of promising prospects to be really a gateway uh, to Libya and to the, to the rest of Africa. 
Now, FDIs, nevertheless, I think they're not, they're definitely not uh, achieving their potential. And there's a lot of question marks still ahead of uh, investors. One is the review of the investment code, which is um, just been um, in the making for quite a while, a number of privatizations, and the lack of overall visibility that, uh, that a lot of entrepreneurs here in the country often report as their, their biggest constraints. The overall visibility in terms of political, but also economic visibility. What is the economic agenda uh, looking ahead? Now, uh, given it particularly the audience out there, I wanted to just uh, put a little slide on the role of international community and diaspora. There is an interesting appetite to invest in democracy. Uh, there's a lot of new donors, new players coming to place, but this appetite is not, is gonna, is not gonna last forever. So it's very important that we get it right, the international support actually come and help Tunisia at this critical juncture and, 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 and that support comes smart and, and fast when the appetite is still there. What is the role of diaspora? Now, it's, I think increasingly, the more you look at the, the, the data of the Tunisian economy, the more you see that the diaspora can play a, a major role. And if you look at the remittances this year, have actually, uh, actually has grown dramatically by a plus 25% in one year only. Considering in 2000, 2011, also remittances were pretty strong. Remittances today constitute uh, um, um, a more important source of brand of him than tourism uh, in Tunisia. And uh, so there is a lot that these remittances uh, can still play and also converting those remittances into, uh, into actual investment. There's a lot of appetite from the Tunisian diaspora to, uh, to come into Tunisia and put some of these savings and invest in their own country. And that is the important force that we should... Uh, there's not a lot of people talking about it, but I think that's, that's something that we should definitely uh, take into consideration. What are the latest social economic development? Actually, I'm almost at the end. Uh, um, if you look at 2012, I mean, following contraction 2011, Tunisia experienced a gradual recovery, and that's today's data of 3.6. Uh, what has been this recovery? A lot of this has been a simple readjustment to a, to a you know, simple arithmetic readjustment to a, to a GDP decline in 2011. Of course, when you have a minus two to start from, it's relatively easier to get a set rebound. But also tourism has picked up. The phosphate production, which was basically almost coming to a halt during 2011 because of the protests around the mining areas, actually has resumed quite a bit. And agricultural sector, which has been really the engine um, uh, the engine sector, a lot of feeding, feeding a lot of consumptions in Tunisia, but also agricultural sector has, has played quite well in serving uh, the neighbor uh, Libya. And also rise of an FDI we talked about. But most of this, this growth, where does it come from? It mostly has been a consumption-led growth driven by higher wages and, I must say, subsidies. Uh, we'll talk from, uh, maybe more about that. Now, um, this, this is sort of on the macro side, but actually... There's a persistence on the regional and social imbalances. Tunisian unemployment is still very high and with, uh, with even higher rates among young graduates and uh, among uh, women graduates. Inflation, as, as Mustafa said, is becoming an increasing concern. In January, the, the, has, has actually spiked to 6%. And it, it is indeed a big uh, concern for a country which is not really growing at very high rates. Um, all of that is happening against the backdrop of deteriorating public finances and spending, which require uh, vigilance. One of, the, one of the things that this country inherited from the Swiss trade is actually quite prudent macroeconomic balance. It. Those um, further to uh, government expansionary policy mix, of course, we're facing now a higher deficit, higher debt, and an external position which has actually weakened. Um, and that actually poses a risk in the medium term. Investments are suffering, and that's, that's another critical point. A lot of expenditure has been driven by social demands, uh, while public investments remain highly subdued. Political economic predictability also hamper investment, particularly in private, private investment. And then there is an, in, in, an emerging feeling here, particularly between the businessmen, about the, uh, the a possible credit crunch. I mean, credit crunch probably is just too big, a, big of a word, but it, in, indeed, um, banks which are already in difficulties, they actually they tend to be more and more reluctant to uh, to lend, which creates an important bottleneck. 
Now, looking forward, how do we see uh, Tunisia? I mean, we see 2013 as another year of transition with, uh, with modern growth, with, uh, but, but still um, with facing large, ex both endogenous and exogenous uncertainties and, and risks. Political stability, first and foremost, the stabilization on, on the neighbor, on this important, most important neighbor, Libya, and the economic uh, recovery of, of, uh, of Europe, and of course, the Sahel conflict and all this uh, impact that it might have, making the achievement on a growth target of 4.5% very certain. What can be done in the short term? There's, there's actually the, the agenda is actually massive. But if one has to summarize a few of the key, uh, uh, key uh, way that, that the country should, should look forward is actually to relaunch priorities, is really to relaunch investments, restore confidence, and handling the social pressure which, uh, and the quest for uh, an immediate um, revolution uh, dividend in many ways and a request for, for immediate jobs. Um, in the long term, Tunisia needs to rethink as an economic model, finding ways to make it more inclusive, more generating jobs, um, and also reforming the education system, which hasn't always served the country uh, quite well. Now, the banking sector reform remains a, a very important priority, I, I would say, both in the short and the long term, but also regional integration. I think regional integration, I'm a strong believer, and we as institutions, we have, have done a lot of work on, uh, on regional integration. We believe that this, uh, this increasing, in, increasing the connection, and uh, both in terms of trade, labor, and investments between the countries uh, around in Tunisia, surrounding Tunisia, including the whole African continent, can be an interesting opportunity uh, for the country for for rebound. All of this needs a consensus for reform, and this is this is this is, a, this is paramount. And I think I'll, I'll let other speakers actually speak on this and the political difficulties. I think uh, I think that's where um, some of the difficulties and the challenges they, they will be. Um, now looking at uh, looking forward, actually. I'd like to leave you with this uh, final slide of hope uh, for those, for Tunisians in the room. They definitely, I'm sure they, they recognize this gentleman up there, one of the most famous uh, poet of the, uh, and most uh, uh, internationally renowned uh, poet, uh, Tunisian poet, which actually um, wrote several inspiring verses for both some of the revolution slogans, but also the national anthem. And actually, that's uh, that's a, one of his one of his best pieces. That uh, I mean, I don't know if, if most of us, some other Tunisians in the room, they want to actually read this. But um, if they will allow my uh, my humble sort of uh, translation, um, it's really about the, the the hope of rising up and standing up and walking, walk, take, walking for life, and uh, sort of encouragement to the country to to really fear nothing. Don't be afraid of what happens behind them and actually uh, walk forward. So with this message of hope, I'll, uh, I'll give the chair back the, uh, uh, the floor. Thank you, Emanuele. If you can stay with us, uh, I see that the governor has taken a lot of notes, so probably you will comment on something. I will ask uh, Steve the director of the POMED Center, which is one of the leading places in Washington, D.C., if you want to follow, to follow the, the Maghreb countries, the Middle East, and so is a very proactive organization. And so, Steve, tell us, uh, in your opinion, what's uh, the economic but also the political scenario in this delicate country? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Daniele. Um, I, yeah, I will. Uh, I, this is all very interesting um, and very informative for me uh, from both of the speakers so far and sort of the economic side and, and the you know, immense challenges facing Tunisia and the consequences uh, of, as um, Mustafa Nabli described, sort of the uh, political crisis and coming to head with an economic crisis and the, f the fact that the political process up until now has really failed to address economic concerns. Uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about some of the political trends in the country and a little bit about what I've seen in Tunisia over the last couple of years uh, as context to kind of the, the current environment um, and the sort of you know, current uh, political crisis that's really peaked uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, since, uh, especially since the assassination of uh, Shukri Belaid. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, 
Mr. Nubley uh, mentioned the, the the sharp polarization in the country, and I think politically that's sort of the the, the dominant dominant feature uh, right now, and the the you know really the the number one obstacle to progress on, on many fronts is a sort of sharp polarization, and the different perceptions on the on the two sides, the polarization between sort of largely Islamists led by Nahda and and, and secularist uh, opposition. And I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about background and kind of how we've gotten to the, the very extremely polarized uh, environment that we find ourselves in uh, today, which, uh, looking back to, to the, you know, the revolution and the overthrow of Ben Ali uh, in, in January 2011, so more than two years ago now, I think immediately following the revolution, there were, in, in the months right after that, there were fears of this sort of polarization of Islamists and secularists, and, and there were fears of, of Nahda and sort of ex Islamist, Islamic extremism and um, the ideas that, Islam, uh, that Nahda and other Islamists may sort of seek uh, to change the face of, of Tunisia and to change Tunisian society. Um, in 2011, I think Nahda, uh, the Nahda party focused uh, heavily on combating these, these fears, and a lot of, if you look at their um, you know, their actions in 2011, they, you know, repeated statements and comments uh, by, you know, uh, Nahda leader Rashid Kalanushi uh, sought to sort of alleviate fears uh, really in two communities, alleviate fears inside Tunisia domestically of, of Nahda and assure people that they were not, that Nahda was not sort of the radical extremist movement that some feared that they were. And then just as important or perhaps, you know, even more important to Nahda was sort of alleviating these fears of the international community. And, uh, and they so selected Hamadi Jabali, who has been now the prime minister, but, but even before that as a sort of largely public face of the party who was seen as someone sort of pragmatic and uh, more, more moderate. And he did a high-profile trip here to Washington uh, in, in, you know, the late spring of, of 2011, did uh, meetings here uh, to sort of assure people that uh, Nahda was committed to democracy and was not uh, you know, something to be afraid of. And I think at that time, uh, Nahda was focused on uh, ensuring that they wouldn't be excluded from the political process or that they would be viewed, you know, they had seen, um, you know, Islamists, uh, you know, excluded or seen as illegitimate uh, by the international community in, in other places in the past. And so this was a, a real focus for them. Uh, and their their campaign uh, in the elections in October 2011 uh, was not a campaign that focused very heavily on their sort of Islamist identity or ideology. Uh, it focused heavily on sort of them as not being corrupt and as having been uh, sort of the actors that were most uh, kind of the victimized and targeted by the old regime and sort of took advantage of this sort of revolutionary spirit uh, and, and stayed to a degree away from sort of the Islamist uh, ideology. And then after their, their success in, in these elections uh, in October 2011, uh, they were seen as sort of reaching out and forming this Troika coalition uh, with uh, two parties that were not seen as Islamist parties, the Chikatu Party and, and CPR uh, Party. And uh, I think sort of for more than a year, sort of the, the emphasis of, of, of Nahda was in this sort of uh, assuaging fears and reaching out and sort of being seen as willing to work with uh, with you know others on, across this this perceived or feared divide. Um, last year in 2012, this this kind of began to change, and I think uh, we we saw sort of the uh, emergence of uh, you know conservative Islamist movements and Salafi movements, uh, and that were that pulled Nahda sort of back in the direction of more conservative ideology. Uh, Nahda, you know, in 2012 began to see uh, sort of some of the Salafist trends as important competitors uh, to themselves. And this pulled them in that direction. And I think we, you know, especially, you know, beginning in sort of uh, maybe early summer last year, uh, we began to see sort of this vicious spiral in which Nahda began to be pulled by the emerging conservative trends uh, that, that you know are similar to some of what we see, have seen emerge in, in other countries across the region in, in the last uh, you know 18 months, and as a result, uh, the, this kind of pulling away uh, exacerbated fears 
uh, kind of pre-existing fears began to return. And NAFTA, in some sense, sort of made the calculation that it was more important for them uh, to keep the support and uh, sort of of their more conservative on their more conservative side and more conservative flank. Uh, and as they began to then lose support, perhaps of some in the middle, uh, you know, then uh, you know, they had fewer kind of you know moderate or centrist uh, supporters to protect. And which, which led them to, to kind of continue uh, even further. I, I have visited Tunisia regularly throughout the last couple of years, and I, and I remember um, seeing a really stark kind of difference in the, the political mood over the course of 2012. Uh, and I was there in October, and there were sort of escalating, um, you know, tensions, and there was an incident uh, of violence, uh, particularly in, in Tatooine in, in October, that sparked lots of kind of fears and, and protests, and uh, there also sort of emerged the, these very different narratives between the two sides, with Nahta feeling as though um, the other side was, each, each side seeing the other as anti-democratic and against the goals of the revolution, and with Nahta seeing the, the secularists and the opposition to them um, as not accepting their the legitimacy uh, that, that was bestowed on, upon them by the elections, um, and the opposition uh, seeing NAFTA as wanting to move forward in an overly majoritarian, exclusive way, uh, and not being open to consensus building. But you know, if you talk to those in NAFTA, they would uh, feel as though they had to move forward and they couldn't achieve consensus, or that they were trying to. But the, but the other side, the opposition and secularists. Uh, you know, saw it as though they had no interest in consensus and they were moving forward and acting not on behalf of all Tunisians, uh, but really on behalf of their supporters and increasingly on behalf of the sort of radical uh, conservative Salafi uh, elements of, of their supporters. And there was a, a, a video online, one in particular, there have been many, but there's one in particular in which uh, Rashid Ghanoushi was speaking to a group of Salafists and sort of assuring them that you know they had to sort of play within the rules of the game for now, but that that in in the long term, uh, that Nafta's goal uh, sort of goals were aligned with theirs, and and, and these, this sort of thing really exacerbated uh, the, the the polarization. Um, and now, just within the last couple of weeks, um, you know I, I think uh, you know events have have really continued to stoke these fears. Um, there have been. You know, I, I mentioned the sort of importance of Hamadi Jabali as a figure within Nahta that was seen, uh, you know, as the prime minister, as a sort of, to many, as sort of representing the more moderate, pragmatic wing of, of Nahta. Now, just, you know, over the past week, um, his efforts to move, to replace the government by a technocratic government uh, ha have failed, uh, and he, he seems to, to be kind of being pushed out and marginalized within the party. Um, on one hand, this sort of, you know, over the past week has enhanced his credentials and credibility uh, by the opposition, uh, but they fear that, that this, you know, the, the developments over the past week uh, are, are really a sign that sort of the kind of more conservative, most radical uh, elements within NAFTA uh, are really sort of dominating and pushing out the more moderate uh, pra pragmatists that are willing to work with the opposition, that are, that are willing to take a more uh, consensus-based approach. Uh, just, you know, uh, the, um, in, in terms of, I'll say a few words about kind of the negotiations uh, just over the, the past week. Uh, there, and, there, and actually, before, before that, I'll just make a note. I mean, the uh, assassination a couple of weeks ago, you know, obviously shook things up and sparked uh, efforts kind of to, to move on, on, you know, including move on, on having a new cabinet. Uh, which, you know, these were efforts that were underway for a couple of months. There was a desire to have a new cabinet in place by the, the two-year anniversary of Ben Ali uh, being overthrown, uh, which failed. There have been sort of, you know, ongoing uh, efforts to, to uh, you know, negotiate o over the, the cabinet ministries. Um, and then Hamadi Jabali took the, you know, as prime minister, took the, the action, the, the re rather dramatic kind of immediate reaction on the, on the day that, of this assassination a couple of weeks ago of announcing the dissolution of the government and that he was going to form a, a technocratic government. Um, and I, I think this now is viewed by the opposition as a very admirable and positive effort. Uh, I think it was done in a somewhat clumsy fashion and that he had not consulted 
uh, sufficiently, either within his own party or with the opposition. And so some of the opposition uh, initially reacted with skepticism, even some of those who had been calling for exactly this kind of step uh, for, for some time. When he first announced it, they, they viewed it with cynically and, and because he had not sort of consulted with them. Um, and, and this effort, you know, essentially now appears to have failed. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, kind of some you know, discussions and back and forth and, and some demands, uh, you know, that are sort of uh, keeping uh, things from moving forward now. Uh, one of the principal demands of the opposition has been that uh, there be uh, neutral sort of apolitical uh, ministers not from an ACTA party in the sort of four referred to as sort of the four key ministries of sovereignty, the ministry of uh, justice, the ministry of foreign affairs, the ministry of interior, and the ministry of defense. Uh, currently, the first three of these are, are all uh, have been uh, NAHTA ministers. Um, it, just now in the last couple of days, it appears that NAHTA is, you know, there have been some statements, including by the current minister of justice, who has sort of emerged as, as NAHTA's leading candidate uh, to be the, to form a new government and become the new prime minister. Uh, he made some statements, uh, including today, that they were su suggesting that they uh, were willing to make concessions uh, on, th on these ministries uh, other than the Ministry of Interior. Um, and this is – and from the, all the opposition leaders' uh, perspective, the Ministry of Interior uh, is perhaps the, the most important uh, the, 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 and the most important uh, that they would like to see uh, be, you know, um, headed by a technocrat and someone who's politically independent. Uh, there's a perception that NAHTA is using the Ministry of Interior um, you know, both uh, to exacerbate the kind of cycles of violence. There has been a lot of suspicion that, that uh, radical Salafi elements and Islamist elements that have been using violence are tolerated completely by the Ministry of Interior and the security forces are not, are not willing to go after them. There's also suspicions and kind of feeling that the Ministry of Interior has also been used very heavily by NAHTA to give out sort of uh, patronage and um, fill the security forces and also kind of bureaucratic civil service positions uh, with their supporters uh, as part of uh, sort of their strategy to prepare for the, for the next elections. Um, so I, you, we're at, at the moment at a bit of a standoff. I, I think just in the last couple of days you, you see uh, that NAHTA is trying uh, to perhaps make some concessions um, but I think they're not, as of yet, willing to make the concessions that the opposition considers to me the most important. Uh, so, you know, it will be very interesting to see over the next couple of weeks um, there should be, you know, uh, you know President uh, Marzuki should select, uh, you know, someone new, uh, likely from, from Anahta, but, but wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have to be uh, by law uh, to be the, form the new government and to be the new, new uh, prime minister. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll see. But there's a lot of fears right now uh, that, you know, anyone selected from Anahta is going to be uh, considerably less open to consens uh, consensus and compromise uh, than their uh, predecessor, Jabali, uh, and so fears that a lot of this sort of polarization and kind of escalation of violence um, will, will continue. Uh, as a, the last note I would make is that, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, the fears about the basic security situation in the country have also dramatically escalated, and uh, you know there's a real you know, and this is in a sense sort of been building over several months, but really just in the last couple of weeks, there's a real lack in sort of confidence in just kind of basic security and personal safety, uh, and uh, you know extreme suspicion um, that you know of sort of the emergence of different. Uh, violent groups or in Islamist groups uh, and, you know, a, a real sense that the security forces are, are not, uh, you know, willing to protect or, or not committed to protecting the citizenry. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn to Alexis that I think will elaborate more on, on some of the security situation. So, <clears throat> as you know, Alexis is a, a frequent panelist here and in many universities around Washington because she is one of the best experts and she is working on this field for the Congress of the United States of America. So she has a very delicate position. We are connected with the media in Tunisia, which, uh, as I said before we started, we are in streaming with many friends in Tunisia that we want to thank for the following. And uh, now Alexis. 
Thank you. Thank you, Daniele. And um, on that note, um, I'd like to note that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Congressional Research Service or the Library of Congress, but only on my own behalf. Um, and also that I can't possibly be considered an expert in this um, group of people. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I have the, the lucky um, position of going after these other great, great speakers. Um, and I was asked to focus on security issues, um, including the impact of the regional security situation on Tunisia. So I'll, I'll start with that, and then I'll loop back to the, this internal, these internal security threats that, that Steve touched on. Um, so it, it's uh, fairly obvious that Tunisia faces both internal and external security threats. The external threats are relatively easy to identify. These are difficult times in North and West Africa. Um, Tunisia borders Algeria and Libya, and its southern Saharan border regions have proven extremely difficult to control and to secure over the last two years. Um, highly, smuggle, highly armed smugglers are reportedly, reportedly active in ferrying everything from basic goods to uh, weaponry and persons across the border from Libya in particular. Uh, and there is some concern that southern Tunisia may serve as a transshipment point for terrorist and insurgent groups active elsewhere in the region. The evolving situation in northern Mali, uh, where French military forces are engaged in ongoing combat operations against a loose coalition of Islamist extremist groups, uh, including al-Qaeda in the, in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, which is an Algerian-led, Algerian-origin, regional criminal and terrorist network, uh, these groups until recently had free reign over a massive territory in northern Mali at the heart of the Sahara Desert. Uh, this situation has further contributed to regional security concerns. Tunisia has increased its security deployments in border areas, but to some degree policing its remote southern uh, extremity might be a challenge for years and years to come. I would say as a side note that the conflict in Mali is emblematic of broader political and security strains affecting the region uh, as we speak. The fall of the Gaddafi regime in Libya led to a surge in regional weapons and combatant flows through uh, an area of the world where national borders are notoriously porous and difficult to secure. At the same time, weak and or transitional regimes in North Africa have been unable or unwilling to exert the kind of authoritarian control over their national territories and populations that their predecessors made a hallmark of their style. So that's a particular sort of domestic political challenge for them, but in turn uh, an international security challenge for countries like the United States who have historically relied on leaders in the region and on security forces in the region to act, uh, you know, to tamp down regional unrest and, and security threats. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which I mentioned, um, which some analysts see as the driving force among the various extremist actors in northern Mali, appears to have tried to establish a presence in Tunisia, although the, the degree to which it does have such a presence uh, is, is somewhat uh, unclear. Multiple times over the past two years, Tunisian security forces have clashed with militants described as affiliated with AQIM, notably in the south and along the Algerian border. And these incidents uh, have grown particularly frequent in recent months, although, again, it's very hard to disaggregate between sort of who exactly these militants might be, and there's often not a whole lot of information released in the press. AQIM has threatened uh, explicitly to carry out attacks in Tunisia and, interestingly, has criticized aspects of Natha's policy platform, uh, although, as far as we know, it has not succeeded in pulling off a major incident within Tunisia. The U.S. Embassy... In Embassy in Tunis, of course, <clears throat> was attacked by a mob in September 2012, three days after the Benghazi attacks in Libya. But there have been no public statements from U.S. executive branch officials linking uh, those incidents with AQIM or um, indeed shedding much light on those incidents at all. In October 2012, Tunisian President uh, Marzouki uh, stated in a media interview that the center of gravity for global terrorism was shifting from Afghanistan and Pakistan toward North Africa. And he expressed concerns that Tunisian Salafists might have connections with Al Qaeda, um, although he did not elaborate very much on this, on this point. The impact of Mali's instability and international reactions to that instability on radicalization in the region remains to be seen. But you see attempts already by AQIM and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is based in Yemen, 
to, uh, through their propaganda efforts, to leverage French intervention in Mali to aid with their regional recruitment and support. Concerns over domestic Tunisian reactions to French military operations, as well as perhaps divergent policy preferences, may explain Tunisia's ambivalent stance toward French intervention in Mali. Even though France has justified these operations as targeting terrorist groups that Tunisia identifies as a security threat. In the first week of the French operation, uh, this was in mid-January, Tunisia's foreign minister, or perhaps then foreign minister, we'll see what happens with the foreign ministry, who is from the Nahda party, stated that Tunisia opposed foreign military intervention in Mali and preferred an African-led solution to Mali's security crisis. That said, I would say overall Tunisian elites are primarily internally oriented, uh, especially with the events of the past uh, week, and have not positioned themselves or Tunisia as, a, as major international players on Mali. Instead, they have let um, regional heavyweights like Algeria uh, and sort of the international community take on that, that role. Separately, Tunisia appears to have been a prominent source for years, in fact, a decade, um, a significant source for its size, in particular, of foreign terrorist fighters beyond the country's borders. Uh, and there are open source reports of Tunisian pipelines currently supplying fighters to Syria and Mali. According to the Algerian government, 11 of the attackers in the ominous hostage crisis were Tunisian nationals. And of course, that uh, hostage seizure um, was said to be carried out by an AQIM splinter faction. Tunisian officials may fear what happens when foreign fighters if and when foreign fighters return home. I would say that Tunisia's internal security threats are more difficult to identify and to really get a, a handle on. Um, as Steve mentioned, religiously conservative Salafists have become vastly more visible in the post-Ben Ali era and have challenged the government and liberals through protests, threats, and violence. Um, and I, I think we've you know, Steve has done a great job of setting up the, the, the ways that this plays out in Tunisia's political process and, and the challenges that it creates for uh, Tunisian political actors, in particular this sort of toxic gulf of mistrust among uh, or between Islamist supporters and secularist activists over uh, how Salafis should be handled and, and over uh, the, the government's security response. Violence by Salafis has often been employed for aims related to personal behavior, expression, social issues, you know, the way people that people dress, consumption of alcohol, art exhibits, um, etc. And this is a serious challenge for ongoing debates in Tunisia over the role of religion in public life and over how to handle potentially foundational constitutional issues such as freedom of expression and worship. But I would disaggregate that kind of violence, for now at least, from a smaller subset of Salafist groups in Tunisia who appear to have a more carefully coordinated organizational focus on challenging the uh, legitimacy of the government and indeed the legitimacy of any democratically elected government. In particular, uh, I would single out Tunisia's Ansar al-Sharia group, which shares a name with extremist groups in Libya and elsewhere. Um, which was founded by a former member of the Tunisian combatant group, a recently dormant entity that operated outside of Tunisia, notably in Afghanistan and, and allegedly in Europe, uh, and was designated in 2002 by the United States as a foreign terrorist organization. The group has focused on shows of strength, really rather than articulating a, a clear agenda to date. In May 2012, notably, thousands of followers attended a, a a quote-unquote national conference organized by Ansar al-Sharia in the Tunisian holy city of Kerouan. Reports had suggested until recently that the group's leadership had explicitly decided not to consider Tunisia as a terrain for jihad, um, that rather it would focus on sort of preaching and, uh, and social issues within Tunisia, but would continue to support jihad in Syria and then perhaps in Mali and elsewhere. Uh, but that approach could be changing, and there are signs of a growing confrontation between Tunisia's political system and Ansar al-Sharia. Uh, in particular, uh, the group's leader, known as Abu Yad, um, it, it is under a Tunisian arrest warrant, uh, partly in connection with the embassy attacks in September, but also in connection with other incidents, 
but he remains at large. An effort to arrest him uh, back in September failed after a prolonged standoff at a mosque. Um, he somehow escaped. Uh, he recently gave a, a radio interview that was ordered uh, suppressed by the Tunisian government. Um, so this, uh, this, the choices and calculations of that group and in turn the decision of how to respond by the government are very much developing and, and a dynamic um, process that could turn into a very vicious uh, circle. Um, some uh, Salafists, and, and I know that Daniele has, has noted this in his recent travels to Tunisia, have also attacked re Tunisia's religious and cultural heritage, um, including a string of recent attacks on Sufi tombs. Um, this is uh, reminiscent of similar attacks by extremist groups in northern Mali, but really sort of can be traced back to the foundational ideology of Salafism going back many decades um, that, that rejects any kind of uh, Islamic practice that can be seen as fusional with other religious practices or as idolatry. How uh, Shokri Belaid's assassination fits into this very complicated picture is very uncertain, I think, at this point. And of course, I think there's a tendency by actors in Tunisia and outside of Tunisia to view the assassination through a lens of our of pre-existing interpretation of what's happening in Tunisia and who might be inclined to carry out such such an attack. Uh, there were claims today uh, that suspects have been arrested, but I think it's very unclear who those suspects are or what the purported motive might be. So this is very much something that that remains uh, to be seen. With that. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, I just want to ask a question to the governor, and then I, I understand that Professor Iman Giron has some question also to ask you. Uh, in my generation, uh, which is called Baby Boomer, uh, we remember that we had uh, two previous big transitions. One was when fascism and Nazism collapsed, and the, in 1945, uh, 47, the Americans were the only one able and willing to help uh, Europe. You know, uh, especially for the students, that uh, the losers in the Second World War were almost everyone. The British, the French, the Germans, the Austrians, the Italians, the Hungarian, and so on. The Americans gave us money and also food values and security. And we were able to recover in a such a good way that today you could say that Europe is a success story in also from the American point of view, from the American foreign policy point of view. Second, with the Berlin Wall fall, uh, Europe, Western Europe was able, especially West Germany, to help East Germany, and we had money, a democratic model, again, a value, European Union, and security, mainly vis-a-vis -vis Russia, to be clear. Now, in this case of the Arab uh, Spring, or whatever you want to call transition, we don't have a model, because Tunisia, is what everyone hopes could be the model of tolerance, something that everyone in this room knows. But it's not working. My question to the governor is this one. You, especially the, the Tunisian friends, tend to be very critical uh, with the government and so on. But my question as a foreigner is what the foreign countries the Americans, the Europeans, and the Gulf countries, and so are not doing and should do, because I saw few helps coming to you. And without the money, you cannot have lunch and dinner, and then you, you get mad, because you have promises, and so you have aspiration, legitimate aspiration, and when they, they show you these graphics, you tend to remember that with Ben Ali, something was going better. And the risk uh, in this case is that one day people will say, well, 
with Ben Ali, something like this was not happening, and so and so and so. So, Governor, if you were still in control of the Tunisian economy, what will be your message to the international community? Because uh, from the map, you see that Italy is 80 miles, Europe is 80 miles from Tunisia. We cannot play with the fire, really. We cannot play with the fire. Why do you have a, such a difficult one to start with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to take you some other place, and then I, I come back. Think of Palestine, the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Why is it, I mean, people have been pouring money, everybody, including the World Bank, and including the Arabs, and including the Americans, and including the Europeans, European stance of money. And they have been pouring money, and nothing's happening. Why? Because there is no clear direction. What is, wh where are we going? What are you financing? There is no clear, you know, uh, track of, you know, we talk about peace process, but it's just a word. It's a peace process, but there is no, there is no peace, actually, that is towards which you are going. So, uh, so coming back to uh, Tunisia today and things, so as long as the path you are going into and you are going is not clear, financing is not going to be the, the solution. And as you said, clearly, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Berlin Wall and the Eastern Europe, it was a clear, a clear direction. You have a clear direction. You know where you, you have a, a broad outline where this is going to go, and therefore, financing and supporting is going to make sense and so on. Uh, so that, that gives me to what Steve was, was saying. I mean, in 2011, it was clear because, at least in theory, that the direction was clear. We are going to a democratic transition, democratic process, and we are putting institutions. And therefore, it was, it was making a lot of sense to provide the financing and so on. And I was one of those who you know, trying to make, the, you know, the case for funding the transition because that is prerequisite for the success, okay? Now, if I link it to what Steve was saying in terms of 2012, we have lost the path and we have, side, we have gone off track. Now, there is a real question, what kind of help is going to be useful or not to have it? And here I, I want to make an observation to what Steve is saying. I think the, uh, I, I wouldn't say the original sin, but I think the big mistake, the big mistake to me as I look back what happened, I think it's the basic fundamental misunderstanding of the, two th the uh, October elections. I think that's really the big, the big mistake. Because this election was meant to be election for a constitution, for a constitutional process. And a constitutional process has, you know, a way of being conducted and run. But this election of a constitutional uh, assembly was interpreted or hijacked or whatever you can say it to being uh, a legislative election, to have a government, to have a government to run the country. And therefore the legitimacy we are talking, we are talking about is one where it's being seen and being, you know, kind of portrayed as a legitimacy to govern what it was not. And as of today, the big debate about legitimacy is, is about that. What is the legitimacy about? The election, was it about designating a government that is going to govern and to implement a program for you know, policy, I um, mean, economic policy and social policy and, and so on? Or is it an election to have a concern? And that was the big misunderstanding that we are living in, and that is really the big source of, of confusion. Uh, knowing that, not only that, it was decided explicitly that the election was for a legislative assembly of a parliamentary type. And we are working on the basis, it's like, we have, it's, it's like if we had a parliamentary regime in place, which has its own rules. Nobody said, I mean, when the elections were done, there was, nobody was talking about parliamentarian regime or anything. 
and the election was not, you know, uh, you know how to. So we are now behaving like we are a well-established, I mean, you know, parliamentary regime where the government and things should be designated and formed according to the rules of parliamentary regime. And I think that is really, the, for me, that is the source of the big misunderstanding and the build-up of mistrust that you are talking about and so on. So uh, to come back to your question, uh, for the international community, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult case. It's difficult. I think that uh, clearly the Tunisians have to uh, work out the, um, and, and go back on track. I mean, there is no doubt about it. Uh, but I think the international community as well needs to realize that it should be funding and funding significantly a clear path. Otherwise, you are not helping. So, so it, it's a very, you know, very uh, critical. And, and so we, we, don't want, we don't want the foreign, uh, you know, the U.S. government or anything to be kind of dictating the, uh, you know, the, uh, the process and what needs to be done and what kind of compromise. But on the, on the other hand, uh, the international community is, is, is providing a funding. It is understood that this, if it's going to be additional to what the normal process of funding is of the, you know, after the Second World War or the Europe after the uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall, it was for a given, you know, a process. And that should be, should be um, you know, at least relatively on which everybody should be agreeing. Sorry. So you mean that also, in your opinion, the foreign community is not clear in his mind, the model of what should expect from Tunisia? No, I th no that's not what I, I think it is clear, but I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure that it is making it clear enough. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's Simon, do, do you want to say? No. I see a friend if which worked for IMF uh, on Tunisia. Warbeck. Warbeck. If I may follow on your insight uh, with the Palestinian Authority, actually there is hope in the sense that the, when, when they found Fayyad, they found a way of absorbing the international community. Fayyad has to be, and it was, a great technocratic system. They were not interested so much in ideology. Tunisia is in a much better position for this, but it doesn't seem to have a fire at this stage. It probably hasn't the foreign community on the. Uh, there was hope, I think, when the, the possibility of a technocratic uh, cabinet was uh, in the works, but then that seemed to come up with uh, wrong and good so far. And the question I have is whether. The opposite seems to be happening in the sense that uh, Salafis are influencing in Nasra more and more, and conservatives are coming to support uh, the, the supreme uh, Salafist government theology. So basically, is there a chance for a Fayyad to emerge? I, I wouldn't put it that, I mean, I'm not sure this uh, analogy is, is, is right. I'm not sure. Why? Because the Fayyad regime was about putting the regime, I mean, the Fayyad mission, if you like, was about putting in place the uh, institutional infrastructure for a state, for a new state institutions that are, you know, kind of civil service that is functioning, you know, payment system that is functioning and all of that. And he was, you know, good at that. But his, uh, what he did did not solve the big issue, which was the core issue of the peace process, right? 
because the peace process out of, out of his hands. It was not his. Now, in Tunisia, we do not have a problem of building the state institutions. Actually, we are lucky that we have relatively, you know, good state institutions. What I'm afraid is that they might be, we, we might be, we may be losing that now. The state institutions are weakening now. So we do not need a, a technocrat for that sense, for the sense of the Fayyad things. What, what was proposed recently, as, as uh, I think uh, you mentioned, Steve, about the, uh, you know, Jbali was proposing a technocratic government, it's not because he wants to build the state institutions. He wanted to make sure that as we go towards the next elections, the state apparatus stays at a distance from everybody, every political player. So the ministers that are controlling the government apparatus and the state apparatus are not partisan, are not belonging to, politician, to political parties. So that was the main driver. It's not to have a technocrat to run the government because the bureaucracy, if we let it do its work, it, it has run well the, the, the place in 2011, reasonably okay. And, and I have, I mean, I know from the central bank, I was central bank, I know it, it did a reasonable job, the bureaucracy as such, and, and other ministries. So that's not the issue. So it's, it's a different, uh, different, uh, different point of view, I think. Because we are a bit short of time, if uh, especially students and so want to ask a very brief question, uh, there is a microphone, just, uh, uh, I, I saw that someone wanted to ask. Yes, yeah, please. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, this is for uh, Mr. Nobley, the, um, there were some economic statistics you went over that uh, were not dire, but they weren't very good. So what do you see as being a turning point for Tunisia as far as their ability to pay for imports, uh, service debt, raise money on capital markets? Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, any other Steve, I, I think you wanted to say th something on the... Yeah, you can go ahead and take this question and then I can... I okay. Know, if you'd like. But yeah, I had a comment on... on yeah, uh, do it. Yeah, sure. So uh, you, you also asked about sort of the ability of actors to sort of influence Ghanoushi and Nahda. Um, or, you know, is there opportunity for external actors uh, to do so? I, there may be, but I, I think that... Uh, there have been some sort of big opportunities missed in that regard. And, and especially, I, I focus especially on kind of the role of the U.S. government and the U.S. administration. Um, and, and I think that uh, the U.S. position in, in Tunisia is much, much weaker than it was a, a year ago. Its relationship with the government is much weaker. The relationship with Nahta is, is much weaker. I, and I think that the U.S. and I think also the international community more broadly uh, really made made a, a fundamental mistake. In uh, on, on one hand, it's admirable that the international community and the United States did try to make it a, a priority to support Tunisia's transition in 2011 and 2012. I think some were afraid that that, that wouldn't happen. Um, but sort of as Mr. Nubley described, at that time there was sort of this assumption that the transition was moving in the right direction, and what it needed was support. And so there was an effort to try to have economic support and efforts to try to – there have been, you know, significant efforts to try to encourage investment and trade. But a lot of these failed because what, what there was not was at the same time uh, an effort to ensure that the political processes were moving in, in the right direction. I, and I think uh, Hanushi and Nahta received considerable support from the U.S. government, from the national community, without, say, you know, an effort to say, well, we want to support you, but – there's certain things that that have to happen on the political side, and that is sort of undermining you know, the, the, the efforts to encourage trade and investment uh, cannot be successful uh, when the political process is not moving in the right direction. Um, and then I think the U.S. relationship w was uh, hurt considerably by, by the attacks uh, on the embassy in September. And, you know, if, if you assume that these attacks were – were you know taken by sort of your Salafi elements that that would want the U.S. to have a, a you know lesser role in the country. They were extraordinarily successful in that regard, and, and then and, and very quickly you kind of the, the role of the U.S. has diminished. And just in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, the U.S. sort of clearly supported this Jabali's initiative that has now failed, and they, they're at this point sort of viewed 
uh, relatively weak and, and irrelevant. Uh, I confirm this. I was in Tunis uh, three weeks ago. And, uh, for instance, they told me that the U.S. Embassy is working with very, very few people inside after the attack at the school and so at the embassy uh, last September. This, uh, I, I totally agree with Steve, is something that uh, maybe in southern Europe, uh, where we know each other in the Mediterranean, we tend to be less... Uh, ultra optimistic or ultra negative when something new come as a european i had the impression that the american the approach of the american vis-a-vis -vis the uh, so called arab spring was over optimistic and now is over negative because uh, the governor is right when he say for instance tunisia is a country with uh, uh, civil codes with laws with uh, uh, a very interesting women public opinion, which is one of the pillars of the Tunisian democracy. I would say only on the security, because I don't agree with many observers. I was in Tunis also last year in April, when there were, say, big demonstrations in Avenue Bourguiba. And uh, coming from a European country, from the student movement, social arrest, like you have in Britain, in France, in Italy, almost every week, uh, I spotted two problems. The first one, okay, the police is untrained to tackle the social problems. Well, during a dictatorship, the police torture you. They don't need to know how to handle a demonstration in Massachusetts Avenue if you want to go to DuPont Circle. They don't care because they are not trained. But the second big problem that we spotted in this attack at the Almanuba University that we discussed one, one month ago uh, with the dean of Almanuba here at Johns Hopkins, for instance, was that the police was outside the university, but the orders, the political orders were do nothing. Uh, we have uh, an idea about... 3,000, between 3,000 and 10,000 Salafi in, tu in Tunisia, which is nothing because almost everyone after the attack on the American uh, embassy in Tunisia were uh, very, very sorry for what happened to the American embassy. And the American school was rebuilt for free by the Tunisians. But is enough, 3,000 people threaten you is enough to scare you. When you attack someone in Tunis, everyone knows that Jerba is one of the most beautiful and peaceful places in the world. But your mother will not allow you to go uh, to spend holidays, low-cost holidays, to tu Tunisia because they say, oh, it's a dangerous country. And so, so also this insecurity is cutting down the money, the flow of money, which is coming mainly from southern Europe and northern Europe also to Tunisia, because also tourism is a problem. It's not only the problem of the investment, but also of the flow of foreigners which are visiting the country and helping the economy. So uh, I want to thank everyone, and especially the young uh, Tunisian-American professionals which allowed us to have such an important guest today and very informal and ready to answer. And I just have uh, one, uh, one additional point mm -hmm. to what Steve said about your question. Uh, don't forget that that is exactly the advice that Jebali has given. It's one of their own, has given that advice to Anahda, and they refused. So. That's, that's all I can say, because that was exactly his point. That he has, and he has said today that the formula that they're considering today is going to fail. So he's, he has come on, on, uh, you know, on public and, and saying that the formula of having uh, a, a similar coalition government to the one that was just, uh, uh, you know, that has been dissolved is, is. Now, on the economic situation, First of all, I, I mean, the situation is, is a little bit more difficult than what Manuel was saying in his presentation. Uh, I just want to cite two numbers. I think 
the current account deficit is not 7.5 percent. According to the latest central bank number, it's more than 8 percent. It's 8.1 percent. The budget deficit is not uh, 5 percent, as he's saying, or as 6 percent, as the government's saying. It's really more than 8 percent. So, so the deficits that we have in 2012 are much higher. The debt increasing is 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 is, is much higher than was. So, what? What might be, where is the highest risk as we go forward? I, I'm really not sure. It might be the uh, payments, you know, for the payment, the balance of payment problem, it might be. Uh, it might be government fiscal problems. It might be banking problems. You know, those are the three risks that you run in the financial system. It's, I mean, crisis, financial crisis come in the form of balance payment crisis or, a, you know, fiscal crisis or a banking crisis. Those are the th three types of financial. I don't, I'm not sure which one will, will come first if, if we come to that. But my message is that let's try to avoid each one of them. Let's not have any one of them. That's, that's my objective. My objective is not to have any of those. So we need to work and to make sure that we don't get into that situation. But I'm afraid, I'm afraid that if there is no significant move on the political front to bridge the polarization divide that was, that was mentioned, to resolve the security issues that, ha that has been, and security issues, I didn't talk about them, but it's really a major, major problem because this is, I mean, the tourism sector, as you said, foreign investment, the uh, mining sector, the oil sector is, is, is being, uh, being touched uh, significantly. And we, we forgot, we don't talk too much about it, but that's one of the most hurt sectors in, in 2011, 2012, the, the oil extraction. Uh, and it's not big in Tunisia, it's small, but it's significant for Tunisia as such. So unless we come to grips with the sol with I don't think solving is, is the right problem, at least getting our hands controlling the uh, slippages that we have been seeing on the security front, on the political front. We might hit one of this, you know, financial, uh, financial uh, you know, risks. Which one, I really cannot tell. I cannot tell. It, it depends. It all depends. You, they, you never know, really. You cannot tell beforehand which one uh, is, is going to hit you first. But that was my initial message to, to say that really uh, that's where the, the economy and, and the politics are going to collide some point, at some point in the future if we, we, if we don't heed the, uh, the calls and, and the calls that are coming from the uh, internal. Uh, and I mean, there, there is a, I mean, one of the positive things, maybe to leave you with a, with a positive note, if you like, one of the most uh, positive notes is that there is a very vibrant civil society in the country. And lots, I mean, the, uh, lots of people are putting forward ideas, putting proposals, you know, making, uh, you know, taking initiatives, uh, you know, uh, taking action to influence events. So people are not just sitting and, and having, you know, this uh, happen without, without having. I mean, there is a deep feeling that the, the people have a stake in what's happening, and there are lots of people trying to do something about it. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, some cool heads will prevail, and, and something, uh, something will, will happen that will correct the, uh, the, the path uh, with, towards which we might be going. And maybe Inshallah. That's the way. Yeah. <laughs> Shukran. Yeah, did you want to? No, no, I, I feel that that we weren't able to respond to more questions. But yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Moore, just a question. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, for, the, for the government, if you please, if you are interested, tell us, tell the audience, the relentless, malicious campaign to force you down from your office that's been run and orchestrated by Rashid Ghanoush and now the sympathizer. Please. No, I don't think that's the right place to, I mean, to, no, no, no. to talk about no this. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Um, Ambassador Taylor.